It's a great pleasure to be with you today talking on a topic that seems to be of extreme relevance, Tagore's ideas of nationalism, which were essentially critical of the nationalist ideology. Of course, nobody has any doubt that Tagore was one of the greatest patriots that India had ever seen. But he made a very clear distinction between patriotism and nationalism as an ideology. So I'm here mainly to look at his idea of nationalism and also the implications of that idea all the suggestions, all the various kinds of criticism leveled against his critique of nationalism and also present. I shall begin with a few lines of, from, from Tagore's poetry. Uh, this is from a poem, a long poem called The Sunset of the Century. It was translated by the poet himself from Naivedya and it is included in the English writings of Maybe in another Tagore, second volume published by the Sahitya Academy in 1996. The lines go like this. The last sun of the century sets amidst the blood red colors of the West and the whirlwind of hatred. The naked passion of the self-love of nations in its drunken delirium of greed is dancing to the clash of steel and howling verses of vengeance. The hungry self of the nation shall burst in a violence of fury from its own shameless feeding, for it has made the world its food and licking it, crunching it and swallowing it in big morsels it swells and swells till in the midst of its unholy feast descends the sudden heaven piercing its heart of grossness. I would also quote a sentence from one of Tagore's lectures. He says in the lecture Nationalism in India, there is only one history, the history of the human being. All national histories are merely chapters in a larger one. With these quotes, I will straight away enter my topic, Tagore's critique of nationalism. I'm quite aware that. I am speaking at a time when a war is already on between a small country called Ukraine and a much bigger and much weaponized country called Russia. A war that could any time turn into a world war, looking at the way the nations have begun to react to it, especially big nations like the United States have begun to respond to it. So I think this is the proper time to discuss Tagore's critique of the nationalist ideology and to look at his critique critically and try to understand what exactly he was trying to say. When Rabindranath Tagore was composing the poem I quoted a little while ago, on the last day of the 19th century and writing his essays on nationalism which were first put together in the second decade of the 20th century i'm sure you have come across the book nationalism published in new york in 1917 which has been reprinted umpteen times at that point of time when he was writing this critique and publishing this book, he might not have imagined that by the end of the 20th century, several thinkers across the world were going to echo 
his critique of the nationalist ideology, mostly without ever having read him. So I'm not sure, you know, critics like Benedict Anderson and various other thinkers who have written a lot on nationalism have ever come across Tagore's critique of nationalism. They might have, but most possibly they might not have. But strangely now, towards the end of the 20th century and, at, and the beginning of the 21st century, you find a plethora of texts and lectures of nationalism appearing around the world. So one may find the rudiments of such a critique in thinkers and conscientious objectors like Bertrand Russell, Aldous Huxley, and Jean Paul Sartre. Nationalism entered modern theoretical discourse in a major way only when Benedict and Nelson published his acknowledged communities in 1983. That was soon followed up by a series of treatises on the subject by various political thinkers like uh, Ernest Gellner, who wrote the book Nations. Pro, uh, the author of The Social Preconditions of National Revival in Europe in 1985, Anthony Smith, the author of The Ethnic Origins of Nations, 1986, Partha Chatterjee, the author of Nationalist Thought and the Colonial World, 1986, and of course, Eric Foxbaum, whose uh, famous book nations and nationalism since 1788 to 19 uh, which was published in 1990 is a classic in this series of books on nationalism and this is besides several several articles written in journals across the world in languages other than in english i referred only to some of the books in English, but there are quite a few books in French, in, in Spanish, in, in German, uh, in Italian, and in almost all the major European languages on the idea of nationalism, quite a few of which are now fortunately available in English. Benedict Anderson's book, of course, all of you have read it, Imagined Communities, was initially provoked by the Vietnamese invasion and occupation of Cambodia in 1978-79 and the Chinese assault on Vietnam and all the countries involved, remember, were swearing by Marxism and is proving that nationalism was an ideology that even Marxism could not write off as an anomaly or an aberration, or just the inescapable pathology of modern developmental history, often descending into incurable dementia, as described by Tom Nyan, defined the nation as an imagined community that belonged more with kinship and religion than with liberalism or fascism into their fellow members if, if it, is, it, is it is an imagined community because its members can even without knowing one another or knowing other fellow members can cheer up the image of their communion in the words of ernest gellner Nationalism is not the awakening of nations to self-consciousness. It invents nations where they do not exist. It invents nations where they do not exist. For him, nation is more a fabrication 
as it was to Rabindranath Tagore, who was a committed internationalist. The nation, somebody like Anderson, Benedict Anderson would say, is limited as it is as it has finite boundaries, demarcating them from other nations, like we have the, uh, the Himalayas, for example. It is sovereign as nations like to imagine themselves to be free. So that is the second major characteristic of a nation. The first is that it is limited by boundaries, physical, geographical boundaries. And the second is that it, it has sovereignty, or at least it imagines it has sovereignty. I say, I, I, I repeat, it is they imagine they are sovereign, because very often they are not. Especially in a globalized world, no nation can really say that nation is completely independent and free from other nations. Because there are so many imperialisms, so many major world powers who are competing for hegemony in a world like ours. And in such a world, it is impossible even for an independent country like India to say that ultimately we are sovereign because you are compelled to take positions. You are compelled to make your comments on what is happening in Ukraine and Russia, for example. You are often drawn into controversies. You are even drawn into wars. And so nobody can say that a nation is a sovereign in the full sense, but all nations like to say that they are sovereign, like to believe that they are free and sovereign. And freedom, again, it is, a, it is a community. That is the last characteristic of a nationalism. It is a community. As it glosses over its inequalities and is conceived as a deep, and a horizontal comradeship for which you can kill or die. So that's why, you know, Benedict Anderson calls a nation an imagined community. Why is it imagined? Because if you really look at India, there are so many religions, so many castes, so many classes, so many races. So you cannot say it is a uniform or monolithic community. Of course, it is a community, but it is a very diverse community. With, uh, as I said, with many races and religions and castes and classes uh, and sects and forms of worship uh, and regional cultures and regional languages. And it is this, this diversity that actually defines a country like India and makes it different from monolithic uh, European nations. But we also like to imagine that we are a community whose culture is the national culture. Is the Hindu culture the national culture? Are Christians and Muslims and Parsis and Jews and uh, Buddhists and Jains actually Indians? Uh, is India a country of aliens or of Indians or of the early African tribes? There are so many questions being asked and being debated all around us today as it happened in, in Germany uh, at the arrival of uh, Nazism. And so nationalism is not a very innocent and simple concept as it is often believed to be and as we often see it to be. And this was something that Tagore discovered quite early and spoke about it boldly and daringly, because it required real boldness to speak, to critique, critique nationalism at the time when he did that, because national uh, freedom struggles were coming up in various nations. There were wars being fought in the name of nationalism. And at that time, it was not easy to speak about nationalism, even in India, not to speak of Japan or China and other countries where, where he spoke about nationalism. I will now straight away enter Tagore's views of nationalism. I, I shall try to sum them up. Tagore 
Hartford's views on nationalism are summed up mainly in three essays. Nationalism in the West, nationalism in Japan, and nationalism in India. Originally, there were three lectures delivered in Japan and the USA, published for the first time, along with the translations of five of Tagore's poems around the same theme, including the one that I had quoted at the beginning of this lecture. And uh, all of them are put together under the title Nationalism and published by Macmillan in New York in 1917, as I mentioned earlier. Europe was at war at that time. And E.P. Thompson points out that though the World War is not the central theme of Tagore's nationalism, it is ever present in the background as proof of the self-destructive tendency of the organized modern nation. So this is something that we ought to remember when we read Tagore's essays or, or, or when we listen to Tagore's lectures on nationalism. They were written in a context of war. When every nation was at war with every other nation, almost. And so Tagore saw that nationalism, the pride it generated, what you can call hubris in the, you know, the, it's the term used uh, in uh, by Aristotle uh, to, to when he describes Greek tragedy, national extreme pride, egoism. So national egoism and the hatred of other nations, these were the two primary feelings behind every war. This was what Tagore, this what perhaps we find, even when you look at the war between a small nation like Ukraine and a bigger nation like Russia, you will find there are, there, there are two kinds of egoism working behind the war. Russia thinks it is a big country. It's almost like an empire and it can never be attacked. How can a small country uh, imagine attacking it? And Ukraine thinks the opposite. We are a small country, but we are independent. We are sovereign. And how can a big country like Russia, uh, which was uh, almost the leading nation of the Soviet Union, in which Ukraine was also uh, a a, a, a participant nation as you can as you very well know so they imagine how can russia attack us because we are free and we are sovereign so there are two it is not only two countries which are fighting but two egos uh, the the ego of russia and the ego of ukraine so from this contemporary example we can very easily go back to tagore and understand what Tagore meant by national hubris or, or national egoism, Reshi Ahanda. So that was something that Tagore found to be extremely dangerous, fatal to nations themselves and to other nations. So the publication of Kare Bayre in 1917, followed by its English translation, by Surendranath Tagore three years later, in some ways complemented these lectures. Uh, I am sure you have read Kare Bayre. Uh, and so in, in Kare uh, Bayre, uh, there is again an implied critique of nationalism. Because uh, it, is a kind, it was written as a kind of, uh, uh, in order to complete what he wanted to say in the lectures. Because the nation, uh, the novel was highly critical of the Sodeshi movement. One may also remember in this context, uh, Tagore's disagreements with Mahatma Gandhi on the cult of the Charka in the well-known article he wrote in the Modern Review. And, and also on some questions about Swaraj. That's also his essay, East and the West, besides 
some of his essays on art and education. Actually, they have to be read together. Along with the three essays on nationalism, perhaps you have to read also his uh, response to Gandhi's article in the Modern Review, uh, his essay on uh, called Some Questions About Swaraj, and also another of his famous essays called East and the West, uh, and, and even some of his essays on art and education, because there he has a famous essay called Is There an Indian Art? And he says that no, art is ultimately human, international, and uh, there is nothing like a nas uh, nationalist art. But let me take uh, these lectures one by one very briefly. In nationalism in the, in the West, the first in the series of lectures, Tagore states his position without much ambiguity. I quote him. Neither the colorless vagueness of cosmopolitanism nor the fierce self-idolatry of nation worship is the goal of human history. And he asserts, I am not against this nation or that nation, but against the idea of the nation itself. I am against the idea of the nation itself. He also defines nation in doubtless terms. And this is how he defines nation. A nation in the sense of the political and economic union of the people is that aspect which a whole population assumes when organized for a mechanical purpose. Unquote. Tagore recognizes the problem of races as the most menacing of the issues faced by India, making our history a continual social adjustment rather than of organized power for defense or aggression or the rise and fall of dynasties as in the case of most of the other countries so tagore was very much aware of the racial question uh, in india which has become very important uh, uh, in the present context because uh, say, there are people who say aryans alone are the true indians but history and genetics and ethnography and linguistics have proved time and again that Aryans were some of the last comers to India. The first comers were from Africa. Then came people from the Mediterranean regions. And only third came around 18th century BC or so, people from the Central Asia, like Iran, who came to be called Aryans, even though Historians like Romila Thapar do not agree uh, that there is a race called Aryan. She says there is only a group of languages called Aryan languages and there is no race called Aryan. So, and there is a whole debate around this issue, as you very well know, and it is a, it has become a very hot uh, political debate. Remember when Hitler came to power in Germany, he also said the same thing. Germany is a country of Aryans and Jews are not Aryans and Jews have no place here. And today we hear some people saying very similarly, this is a land of Hindus and Aryans and Muslims and uh, Christians and other minorities have absolutely no place in India. So Tagore was the first thinker to realize the complication of the racial issue in the making of the Indian nation. And that he thought was the most com most complex issue, not even language, not even regional cultures, and not even religion, but race was a very important issue for Tagore. So social regulation of differences with a spiritual recognition of unity has been the twin strategy for India to cope with her ethnic multiplicity. We often hear that, you know, uh, the, uh, unity in diversity. So we have to accept our diversity and then try to look for what unites all the Indians as a nation. And Tagore also knew that. But Tagore is even more critical of the West, where the national machinery of commerce and politics turns out nearly compress the bales of humanity which have their use and high market value 
but they are bound in iron hoops, labeled and separated off with scientific care and precision. So, so he compares uh, the, the European nations to machines, machines which keep on producing, you know, uh, bundles of people uh, who think alike, who dress alike, and who have the, a common religion, a common tradition, a common language, a common tradition, and so. Uh, the, he thinks of nationalism or the idea of the nation as a kind of a machine that create that creates a kind of undesirable uniformity. He wants India. Remember, at that time, India was not free. He wants India not to imitate the Western national ideal, whose characteristics he sums up in the paragraphs that follow. He makes an important distinction between society and a nation. So this is a very, very important distinction that he makes. Society is one and nation is something else. And what does he mean by that? While society does not have an ulterior purpose and is a natural regulation of relationships and the spontaneous self-expression of man as a social being, nation is an organization. Nation is an organization of people with a mechanical purpose founded on greed, jealousy, suspicion, and desire for power. So he makes a very clear, clear distinction. That is, he, he thinks of society as something natural. It is the creation of spontaneous relationship. It is the spontaneous self-expression of man as a social being. While nation is an artificial creation. And the foundations of the nation lie in negative values. Negative values, you know, like greed, jealousy, suspicion, hatred and mechanical, mere mechanical organization. This also leads to patriarchal power. So nations are also patriarchal. They are very masculine. And even though we, we speak of Mother India, etc., ultimately we also worship uh, men rather than women. Of course, uh, we speak about our great tradition where uh, women were worshipped. We speak, speak of Durga and Shakti and Parvati and all that. But the question is, what actually happens to women at home and what happens to women in the society? And then you will know that our whole nation is extremely patriarchal. It is a very masculine, powerful kind of nation. And we worship masculinity. masculinity. So we worship a leader who is supposed to be extremely masculine with a big chest, for example. Oh, so, so we are worshippers of masculinity, even though we say that our India is our mother. And this is true of every nation. All the nations are ultimately patriarchal. And they sideline or they, they, they uh, marginalize women in general. So because uh, 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 the, the, this leads to patriarchal power as man driven to professionalism turns the wheels of power for his own sake and for the sake of universal officialdom, leaving woman to fight her battles alone. So man is the defender of the nation. Man is the soldier. You know, only recently, even in Indian army, women have been admitted. So generally, army comprises only of men and the men are supposed to defend the nation and to do uh, and to enter many other professions while women are supposed to look after home look after her husband and children and be confined to the kitchen of course we have gone a little ahead of that kind of position but still because i know north indian life very well i, have, I was there for 30 years i know woman woman's condition has not changed a bit in the in uh, in the last uh, say and uh, the year in the years uh, since 1947, woman remains where she was, that is, in the kitchen, making always food for the uh, uh, husband 
obeying his orders and looking after the children. So, so and this is a reflection of the idea of the nation itself, because the nation itself is supposed to be patriarchal. And so within the nation, it is very difficult for women to find a central role and a central position. That is a second point of Tagore's critique of nationalism. And he says, in uh, when uh, nation emerges, cooperation gives way to competition. Having having replaces being. Power becomes abstract as a scientific product made in the political laboratory of the nation through the dissolution of the personal humanity. So he says with the coming of the nation, the, the, the person as a human being disappears and is absorbed into a machine called nation. A machine that is well-oiled, a machine that needs to be fed in time with uh, plenty of martyrs, uh, plenty of dead soldiers, plenty of war heroes, etc. So it becomes a kind of uh, uh, a, a scientific product, a, a political laboratory, and the individual human being, the spiritual human being, is completely lost in this idea of the nation. The integrated human being gets compartmentalized and crushed under the weight of an ever-growing wealth-producing mechanism. Interminable economic war is waged between capital and labor. I'm quoting uh, Tagore. Since the greed of wealth and power is limitless. Because there is no end to your greed. You, you go on wanting to expand your, uh, the, uh, the frontiers of your nation. You want to go on amassing wealth. So there is infinite greed behind the working of the nation. And the jealousy and suspicion they breed end in the catastrophe of war. So, so first there is greed. There is conflict between capital and labor. Because labor is continu continually exploited. Only the capital can grow. Money can grow. And so there is discontent. And, and there is jealousy. There is suspicion. When one nation becomes rich, other nations become jealous. They want to become equally rich. And from that comes competition. And from that comes the catastrophe that we call war. In one sentence, uh, I'm quoting Tagore, the suspicion of man for man stings all the limbs of the civilization like the hairs of the nettle. So uh, like the thorn, it stings you, this kind of a competition and the suspicion that competition always generates. So I, I'm not going into uh, the various metaphors that Tagore, I, I'm, of course, I am personally very much interested as a poet in the tropes and the metaphors and the similes that Tagore uses to describe the nation. Uh, but that will that will take me a whole, then need a whole uh, lecture, a different lecture. So I'm not going into it. I will just say he uses words like, whenever he speaks of the nation, he uses words like, Machine, organization, factory, laboratory. He compares it to a hydraulic press, a power loom, uh, a, 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 a father turning into a gambler, uh, a, a pack of predatory creatures, or it is like a dam to check the flow of civilization. Uh, and so, uh, and sometimes he uses even the simile of various kinds of uh, animals. Uh, so, nation has a fangs, you know, like uh, poison teeth, like the uh, like like the cobra, for example. And then there is a metaphor of the giraffe. Uh, he compares nation to a giraffe because there is a uh, there is a great distance between the heart and the head. You know, giraffe, uh, giraffe's heart and giraffe's belly. That is that lies below, while Giraffe's head is far above. So there is that kind of a distance between the national state and the common people. Uh, and so the nation 
is beautifully and meaningfully compared to uh, the animal giraffe. So there are there are several other you know uh, wonderful metaphors and similes that Tagore uses, uh, in, into which I will not go at this point of time. Anyway, Tagore finds the idea of the nation to be the most powerful anesthetics that man has invented. So uh, it is something like chloroform. It is, an, it is an anesthetic. So nation is the most powerful anesthetic that man has invented. It can make you unconscious. It can make you hate other people. It can make you jealous of other people. It can make you very possessive about your borders and the countries uh, and the little regions in your borders. So it is. It is. It works like an anesthetic. It makes you almost uh, paralyzed or almost unconscious. Like uh, you know, remember T. S. Eliot, a patient deatherized on a table. Uh, you know, when he speaks of the evening, he uses that metaphor like that. He says a nation. It also makes all people patients etherized on a surgical tables. So nation nationalism is it works like an anesthetic. Uh, people become unconscious when they are drunk with nationalism or when they uh, when they uh, take uh, uh, the idea of the nation as if uh, they were taking opium. So it is the fifth act of the tragedy of the unreal. That is another, another uh, expression from Tagore. The fifth act of the tragedy of the unreal. You know, the typical tragedies, like the Greek tragedies and the Shakespearean tragedies, have five acts. And the fifth act is the climax of the tragedy. The nationalism, according to uh, him, according to Tagore, is the fifth act of the tragedy. And what tragedy? The tragedy of the unreal. Because already he has said a nation is invented where a nation does not really exist. And so it is it is something unreal. And so the, the, so there is a whole drama of the unreal, which, which can be a very surrealist or absurd kind of uh, theater. And in that theater, there happens the fifth, uh, the fifth act, which is, uh, which is like uh, the fifth act of a tragedy. Uh, which leads to war and often self-destruction. So in, uh, in his talk in Japan, he advises the Japanese not to imitate the West by organizing themselves on the basis of selfishness, as the European civilization is now, I quote him, choking itself from the debris carried by its innumerable channels. So Europe is suffocating, is getting suffocated by the debris from all around. And he asked Japan not to go Europe's way. Later, he asked India also never to imitate Europe and the mode of European nation. If at all we are a nation, we should never be like a European nation. Here, Tagore uses new metaphors like the weed, and a millionaire acquiring money at the cost of his soul, you know, like 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 Mephistopheles uh, selling his soul. Uh, in a nation is like a millionaire, uh, somebody who, uh, who sells uh, its uh, his soul in order to become very rich. To critique the new political civilization, he uses uh, many such powerful similes. Progress has to be judged according to its original objective and contrast a trains program movement to its terminus with the still and spontaneous progress of the tree towards life and light, the latter being the true measure of progress. So we should be moving towards light and life like a tree. That is where it becomes a real living society. So progress cannot be judged by the speed with which you attain money and the so-called progress and the so-called development that you make at the cost of the poor people or at the cost of environment but it should be but progress here has to be judged according to the spiritual progress that we make the ethical progress that we make that is the uh, movement towards life and light to use the term that tagore uses japan has uh, he said Japan has realized nature's secrets, not by methods of analytical knowledge, 
but by sympathy. So he said we should understand reality not through analysis, but sympathy, compassion, understand, or or I would better use the word empathy by by being others, by living like others, by understanding how other people live. That empathy or sympathy, that is what we should have and not jealousy and hatred. And, and he says, Japan being an Eastern country, understood reality with sympathy. I, so it should not imitate Europe, which, uh, uh, which does not show any kind of uh, kindness. So he, very much like the Buddha, at the center of uh, Tagore's critique of nationalism was the idea of karuna or compassion or uh, uh, or mercy or uh, as they use the word empathy. While you are in the universe, which can only be controlled by war and conquest, Japan has felt in the world the touch of some benign and adorable presence. That is what Tagore said. So uh, Japan has known, uh, to, to make it simple, Japan has known God, known divinity, uh, by which he meant some, some strange, mysterious presence in the world. And such a nation should not run after material wealth and the material organization of human beings. She does not boast of her mastery over nature, he said about Japan. Japan does not boast about her mastery of nature, but to her she brings with infinite care and joy her offerings of love. So she loves nature and she does not want to be the master of nature and she should continue that tradition of loving nature and not of mastering nature. Her relationship with the world is the deeper relationship of the heart. So we should relate to the world with our heart. Only then we will become true human beings. That's what Tagore said. And that's what we expect a poet to say. And the poet also evokes the Buddhist ideal of Maitri. You know, Maitri means uh, fraternity, uh, brotherhood or sisterhood, which is central to Japanese culture. And it invites the people to come out of the tutelage of European culture and uh, uh, of, of European schoolmasters to create their own modernism. So uh, that was one of his central ideas. Uh, East, e, the Eastern world should create a, an Eastern model of modernism and not imitate the Western model of modernism, which has led, made it very mechanical and war-hungry and greedy. So we should have our own modernism. That is one of the central arguments uh, throughout uh, uh, Tagore's uh, thought. He is not against Japan acquiring modern weapons for self-protection, but it should not go beyond her instinct of self-preservation. Of course, Tagore was a realist. So he said, well, if you want to have weapons, have weapons, but you should have weapons only for self-defense and to attack other nations. That is, that is where he would ask them to stop uh, their tendency. Uh, preserve yourself, but don't try to destroy other people and other nations. So the real power is not in weapons, but in the man who wields them. That is what he believed. It is because the weapon does not have any power. Weapon becomes powerful only when a man uses that weapon. And so what is important is not the weapon, but the person who uses the weapon. And if the person is kind, he will try to avoid using the weapon as far as possible, unless it is very necessary for self-defense and self-preservation. So, they, so, so uh, he told Japan not to accept the Western nationalist model, not to accept the motive force of the Western nationalism as, uh, as her own. There are also their belief in the survival of the fittest. Japan should not believe in the survival of the fittest because that is the justification for all this amassment of weapons. The richest country is the fittest country. The country with the la largest army is the fittest country. The country with uh, you know rockets and 
um, you know, uh, various kinds of uh, bombers and uh, 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 various kinds of dangerous fatal arms. They are the richest country. That is the belief that we often have. So we also want to be like America or like any any other European country with a lot, lot of uh, warships and warplanes and uh, uh, always ready for a war. But Tagore warned against it. You can have weapons to defend yourself whenever it is necessary, but not more than that. Don't have weapons to attack other people and, and other countries and destroy their freedom. So the main problem in India, he says, uh, he had another talk in the United uh, States, and that was called nationalism in India. He said, the main problem in India is the hierarchization of our society on the basis of race and caste, and a blind faith in the authority of traditions. So he found two weaknesses in India's idea of the nation. One is India was a divided community and, uh, you know, Tagore was a great critic uh, of the caste system, very much like Ambedkar. He was very critical of the caste system and believed that the caste system should go if India should become a humane nation. And also, in, in addition to that, there was the uh, ra racial discrimination and uh, hierarchies of races. Some people are supposed superior. Some people are supposed to be inferior. And there was also the blind faith in the authority of tradition. We blindly followed tra tradition. So Tagore was not against tradition, but he said we should also be able to criticize tradition when it is necessary, to question the tradition when it is necessary, and not to mechanically follow tradition. So in an attempt to, uh, but he's also happy that India has learned to contain and tolerate difference rather than exterminate the difference, like Europe exterminating the original populations of the countries it came to occupy by force. See, uh, see Tagore also appreciates India uh, because uh, only uh, for this reason it, it is ready to tolerate difference because we have people of many religions, many cultures, many languages and we have been tolerating them. And that is Tagore's reason for appreciating India, a reason that perhaps I am afraid is fast disappearing. And so he said, I appreciate India because many people, people from different parts of the world, different races, different religions, uh, languages, customs, cultures have lived uh, together in India. And that's a matter of appreciation. And, and uh, so otherwise, you know, uh, 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 we could have destroyed people who uh, came from outside, like uh, like uh, America, you know, being colonized, the, the, the British and the Americans uh, going to South America, for example, and killing uh, the original tribal people. That is what they did everywhere. And so Tagore says at least uh, India did not do that. We had many people, many migrations. People came from Africa, people from, came from Mediterranean, people came from Iran and Central Asia. But no race tried to kill other races. And that is another thing for which Tagore appreciates India. But in an attempt to provide an order to the society, she denied to many the opportunity of movement and expansion. So that is what he was afraid. We are trying to give an order to the society. Uh, so you know what happened during the emergency. And so like that, uh, India has been continuously trying to give an order to the, our society. But our society has lived with all these differences. So there is no need to remove all these differences, uh, 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 especially differences in thinking and differences in worldview, differences in culture, differences in language. We need not remove them in order to become a proper nation and try to impose uniformity on a very diverse culture. That is, he, so he was very much afraid that something like that might happen later. Uh, because India, India survives. India is important. India is culturally rich because India is diverse, plural, and that plurality is the strength of India. And if somebody begins to say India should have only one religion, one language, one culture, one tradition, the problem begins because so many people will feel 
that they are alien, they are others, and they have no place in this country. And Tagore, like a prophet and a poet, foresaw what was going to happen to India. If uh, some people begin to say India is only theirs and India does not belong to other people who came from different parts, forgetting that they themselves had come from other parts of the world. All of us have come from other parts of the world. You know, recent DNA studies uh, held on several Indians have proved that if you examine our DNA, we will find the blood of so many races. There are no pure races in India at all. There are because there was always interbreeding. So there is no racial purity and nobody can claim racial purity. So read Romela Thapa, read uh, other, uh, you know, uh, 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 major historians and thinkers, anthropologists and ethnologists and linguists, and you will know we are all, we are a mixed race. There is no point in saying that we are a pure race or there is a pure race in India. But Tagore very well knew that. So, and he knew, uh, Tagore points out that Indians cannot build a political miracle of freedom upon the quicksand of social slavery. That is it. He was a critic of the social slavery that existed in India in the name of the caste, very much like Ambedkar. So on that social slavery, on that loose sand of social slavery, you cannot build a political miracle of freedom. So first, we should have equality. Only then we can think of real freedom. We can, of course, we can have a geographical freedom, but that is not freedom. That the, a, a poor person in India is not free. He may be free to vote or she may be free to vote once in five years, but that is the end of his or her freedom. Then he or she becomes a slave to a rich, a rich person and works for him or her uh, throughout his or her life. So there is a kind of uh, implicit slavery existing still in India, mainly in the form of uh, caste system, uh, because we have Dalits, we have Adivasis, uh, uh, most of whom are still marginalized. And as long as this marginalization is there, we cannot have a common community. We cannot have a human society. And that's what Tagore was really afraid of. We should, without equality, we cannot have meaningful freedom. That was a, a thing, uh, something that Tagore knew and something that Jawaharlal Nehru also knew and went on repeating, and that's why Nehru is very much hated by the champions of uh, one religion, one race, one language, etc. So, uh, uh, in, a, in a response to letters carried by the Modern Review of Calcutta in May 1921, Tagore points the need to liberate man from the organizations of national egoism, which he later in the article qualifies as racial egoism. He co compares or even calls national egoism as racial egoism. He adds, there is, there is no word for nation in our languages. India has to win freedom for all humanity, not to join the holy feast of the West or the mad orgy or mad orgy in the name of the map. So we should, we should not join, we need not join the feast of the West. That is what he calls it, the Western modernism. We need not join that uh, European club. Let us have our identity. Let us create our own modernity. Let us have all the positive elements of tradition. And let us question all the negative elements of tradition. That was the balanced kind of approach that uh, Tagore had towards national tradition. So even when he thought of art, all these things came to him. Because he told the artists, uh, see, uh, see uh, he has a famous essay called Indian Art. You know, he was himself an artist. He writes, I strongly urge our artists vehemently to deny their obligation carefully to produce something that can be labeled as Indian art according to some old world mannerism. Let them proudly refuse to be herded into a pen like branded bees that are treated as cattle and, and not as cows. Art is not a gorgeous sepulcher immovably brooding over a lonely eternity of vanished years. It belongs to the procession of life. It belongs to the procession of life, making constant adjustment with surprises, exploring the unknown shrines of reality along its path of pilgrimage 
to a future which is as different from the past as the as the tree from the sea so that is a beautiful uh, you know quote from uh, tagore's uh, um, article the meaning of our uh, what he was trying to say that uh, he was trying to say two things actually one is that it is not necessary to create a special art called indian art art is art and art from anywhere is art and secondly art is not something created in the past but it is something created in the present for the future so he says that is why he said it belongs to the procession of life it belongs to the procession and it is full of surprises exploring the unknown shrines of reality this was the way in which he looked at art and so even there this the same kind of idea comes in the idea of modernity the idea of tradition the idea of uh, what art stands for of course tagore was criticized in his time for his idea of nationalism because at the time when our national freedom struggle was uh, on the rise he was criticized it was seen by some critics as a water face as tagore had so far been perceived as a founder of inspiration to bengali patriotism as well as indian nationalism so many people said tagore is uh, uh, defeating himself or he is betraying himself by speaking like this about nationalism because he was a great inspiration for indian nationalism you know he is a writer of the national anthem of both india and of bangladesh uh, so uh, so uh, he was earlier a great bengali patriot so people were very critical in the beginning and not everybody but some people who did not understand him actually they were very critical when he began to criticize nationalism so uh, in the early phase rabindranath uh, had an alternate concept of the nation as a voluntarist community produced by shared memory and collective will partha chatterjee has pointed this out you know partha chatterjee has a famous book uh, nation and there he says originally tagore had an idea of the nation which was very different from the western idea of the nation so nation was to him a kind of society but a voluntarist community nobody was compelled to join it people voluntarily join this community called nation and they also share a lot of things they share you know some some things from the tradition some aspects of human life and that is how a nation is formed an idea of a natural nation and that is what later he defined as a society because he found the nation was becoming a very aggressive kind of concept so he had to make a distinction between nation and society so there were there were a lot of uh, critics who criticized uh, uh, tagore uh, 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 krishna kripalani said uh, uh, tagore's criticism of the nation was ill timed his timing was wrong he said what he said was what he was saying was right but he said it at the wrong time because the nation was struggling for independence and at that time he should not come up with the criticism of, of the nationalist ideology that was the the cr criticism of krishna kripalani there were many other pe people who were also so critical of of, of him but gradually people began to understand him when mussolini came up in italy hitler came up in germany and uh, franco came up in spain then slowly people began to understand what tagore was trying to say that nation can become a very dangerous weapon in the hands of authoritarians and fascists uh, like mussolini or uh, hitler or franco so they used the idea of the nation in order to assert their own authority and to become dictators and to destroy all the critics and so that was the danger in the idea of the nation that tagore had already warned about so then tagore began to be better appreciated and then the war came the first world war came and the second world war came again nation the uh, the pride of the nation 
played a major role in the I, in, in, in creating wars and there again you found that people were very people understood what Tagore was driving at what Tagore was trying to say so, uh, so I am again not going very much into that that aspect there were many critics of uh, of Tagore and there were also many people uh, who appreciated Tagore and there were people who criticized Tagore to begin with and later understood him when the world war happened or or when Hitler and Mussolini and Franco happened then they understood why Tagore was critical of the idea of uh, uh, nationalism so he made a clear distinction I have already said between society and nation he also made a clear distinction between patriotism and nationalism it is not wrong to love your country because even animals love the places uh, where they roam, roam about or where they find their food. There is nothing wrong in loving the nation. He never said anything against patriotism. You can remain a patriot and still be critical of a very narrow, insular, exclu exclusivist kind of idea of the nation. So that was what he was actually criticizing. He never said that, but actually he was criticizing not not the idea of the nation itself but a very exclusivist idea of the nation where you keep some people out because they belong to certain religions certain races they speak certain other languages and so they have no place in the nation it was that kind of exclu exclusivist nation then the idea of a nation which creates an other which uh, suppresses all criticism and all opposition uh, uh, which suppresses all kinds of freedom of expression you know that kind of nationalism authoritarian nationalism that tagore actually criticized so he was all for patriotism and you can find many examples if you you lead uh, you look at a character like uh, uh, dhananjay bairagi uh, in his famous story prayaschitta or uh, or look at a play like uh, Muktadhara, or look at the song uh, oi maha manav uh, maha uh, and also the self discovery of gora in the famous novel gora so there you will find in the creative works of tagore you will find what he actually meant by his criticism of nationalism because swaraj must be based on a voluntary association of independent individuals and not on any kind of compulsion or conformity or you imposed the uniformity or imposed the unity that was what he meant that is the different uh, that was so he he will he also believed in swaraj as, as you very well know he was the author of Jan, uh, uh, and so he obviously he believed in swaraj but he believed that that swaraj must be a voluntary communion of the people and we should not impose uniformity upon them you should not tell them all of them should be hindus or all of them should be muslims or all of all of you should be christians or whatever you should belong to one religion you should all speak one language you should believe in one leader you should believe in one ideology you should follow one god please don't say that that is what tagore was trying to say so that must must be a free nation created by free association of individuals on their own uh, so they should not be compelled to become part of the community and their freedom to worship different gods or believe in different religions or uh, different ideologies that should not be suppressed or sacrificed at any cost that was what tagore was trying to say so today we can see tagore's project as an ambitious attempt to construct a counter global by conceptualizing a process of identity formation that will be free from the form of the nation so uh, I, i'm taking some of the ideas of pradeep kumar datta when i say this so tagore had another idea of glo the, the global and uh, you know the, uh, pradeep kumar datta calls it the counter global because today you know we have an idea of globalization where some countries especially the western countries have the upper hand where the third world is completely marginalized the third world is only a market 
a marketplace for uh, raw materials, a marketplace for products, a market for ideas. So, so that is the, uh, the, the, the kind of globality that globalization has brought about. But uh, Tagore dreamed of another kind of global community. And, and which is very close to the uh, socialist idea of internationalism, where every nation is independent, sovereign, every nation can follow its own uh, uh, ways and means and the cultures and languages, uh, but they will come together for the common humanity and stand and fight for the common the, the common good of the humanity. That is the idea of the counter-global that Tagore definitely had. But at that time, as you know, globalization had not taken place. Uh, that uh, uh, American-centric or US-centric uh, uh, form in international uh, uh, in, uh, internationalism did not have that uh, US-centric form. It took in the post-US decades. But the process has been on for centuries, as it is illustrated by Amartya Sen, who looks at the early commercial and cultural interactions between India and the rest of the world at the beginning of the globalizing process. So globalization, if you really look at it, is not something new. You know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking now from Trishur, which is not very far from uh, Musiris, and I was born in, uh, you know, near Musiris. And you very well know that Musiris was a, was a harbor which was connected to all the trade centers of the world. The Romans came here, the Greeks came here, the Arabs came here. Merchants from across the world came here, or spices, they carried pepper, they carried cardamom, they carried all our uh, various kinds of fragrant spices. And instead, they gave us words, they gave us languages, they gave us uh, different ideas. And so, even from that time, much before Christ, a kind of globalization had begun to happen. When uh, nations began to enter trade, you know, already, a kind of globality was created. I, not only things were coming from outside, ideas were, were also coming and also going to outside, you know, from India to China. Buddhism, for example, went from India to China and Japan. So ideas traveled, things traveled, that kind of uh, the global already existed even before modern kind of uh, globalization. So Tagore very well knew that this was happening all through. All through, countries were talking to one another. They were uh, exchanging goods. They were exchanging ideas. And he had deep apprehensions about global survival as a watchful traveler, traversing all the continents of the world, except Africa and Australia. You know, Tagore traveled all over the world. At a time when travel was very difficult, it was not like today. You could not just, uh, you know, get into a plane and go to New York or uh, wherever you want. But at, in, in a difficult time, uh, traveling by ship, Tagore traveled across the world, except two continents, Africa and Australia, where he could not really go. And so he himself was a global kind of uh, person. And he was an anxious observer of the world before and after the First World War. And he was a pacifist, a lover of peace linked to the European movement for world peace. The gap between the conceptualization of the global as a shared space and the institutional possibilities of describing it as an actually existing reality uh, was there uh, in his time also. It was, uh, he wanted countries to enjoy greater freedom, countries not to become uniform. At the same time, he wanted also to keep alive the dialogue among the different countries so that there may be no war, there will be world peace. So he believed in dialogue between different nations and that is what he would call the global, not the, the war creating belligerent globalization of modern times, but a peace loving, humane kind of uh, inter internationalism. So Tagore tapped into the space of opportunity and tried to puncture the Eurocentrism that had so far characterized the narratives of globalization. The problem with the globalization always was this, a theoretical problem. It was Eurocentric because all the people believed Europe was the center of the world. Civilization came from uh, Europe. Culture came from Europe. So Europe was the center of the world. That was a mistaken idea of the global. And Tagore 
very clearly understood that. We, we also have them ideas. It is not that ideas came from there. You know, recent studies of uh, uh, Renaissance, for example, European Renaissance has proved that so many Indian and Chinese and even African ideas went into the making of European Renaissance. So, so, uh, we, are, so we did not have much to learn from them. They had learned very much from us. Uh, and uh, behind the Renaissance, there were a lot of uh, Oriental ideas, Eastern, uh, Eastern ideas. So Tagore thought that it was necessary to interrogate uh, that kind of Eurocentrism uh, and by pointing to the processes of alternative modernities involving the identification of, of local particulars that come into different relationships of complementarity, rupture, hybridization, and so on with the forces of capitalist modernity thus revealing the limits of universal principles that cannot so he, he believed the local and when we so he had an Alternative modernities, not as modernities. Because the culture of the Tangalaya, Ashing, European Adriga Matramala, Indian Adriga, and then you'll always the Adriga. An Eastern modernity was also possible. Not only Eastern modernity, there could be a Chinese modernity, a Japanese modernity, an Indian modernity. So alternative modernities, Badal Adriga. Tagore believed in that kind of, a, uh, you know, uh, type, kind of a, a world where we had several different ideas about what is modern and what is not modern. So, uh, so he believed that uh, we should not just blindly follow Europe and believe that all modern things came from Europe. We had our own modern ideas from which Europe also learned a lot. So Tagore provides, I, 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 I'm coming to the end of the lecture. Tagore provides an alternative to the narrative modes of his time by directly critiquing the basis of the global modern located in the homelands of the West through the through the counter universal. He neither privileges the difference of the post-colonial world nor critiques universalism itself as an embodiment of Western culture. Instead, he interrogates the basis of a universal modern Western project of nation making by posing a counter universal derived from the, uh, the his location in the East. So Tagore was located in the East. So he wanted to come up with an idea of Eastern modernity. And so and his critique of the of nationalism has to be seen as part of that. Because he that is why he told the Japanese, don't imitate the European nations. Don't become like the Europeans. Don't amass weapons. Don't become very greedy. Don't think that money is everything. See, because he wanted to create his own idea of the nation, an Eastern idea of the nation, an alternative idea, and and that was the that is the, that is the central argument he had against. Because when practically, uh, when he was critiquing the idea of nationalism, he was really critiquing the Western concept of nationalism as a single country with a single religion with a single language you know that is that is applicable to most of the uh, western countries and so he said we cannot imitate that kind of modernism uh, because india for example has many religions many cultures civilizations traditions languages so we cannot imitate uh, europe in our idea of uh, nation or in our idea of uh, of of modernism so uh, so I, I will just make a recollection of what I was trying to say. What, what went into the, pro, uh, the, the, the Tagore project, the Tagore project of counter-globalization? What, what were the elements that went into it? One, civilization is defined by the way it is a very important lesson for modern India. It is not. It is not by looking at the way that we treat ourselves that we decide whether we are civilized, but by looking at the way we treat others. 
So civilization is judged by, defined by the way it treats others. It works more as a capacity than as a, fi as a finished and fully articulated trajectory. So civilization is not something finished. It is a process. It is always in the making. It is a becoming and not an essence that is already for. of mankind and the ethic of cooperation and appreciation of differences. If you look at the best of India's teachers, look at the Buddha, look at uh, Jaina, look at uh, uh, I mean, I mean Mahavira, uh, look at uh, Sri Narayana Guru, look at uh, Ramana Maharshi, look at Ramakrishna, look at Vivekananda, all these great masters of Indian thought and also some of the modern uh, think, uh, thinkers of our time like Ambedkar or Nehru or, or of course more than anybody else Mahatma Gandhi all of them had this idea of civilization civilization based on values like Karuna and Maitri of uh, uh, sisterhood or brotherhood that is Maitri and compassion that is Karuna so uh, and that was the idea that Tagore was trying to say a nation should be built a society should be built on compassion and on maitri, on camaraderie. And secondly, the second uh, basic idea, if Europe is one country made into many, India is many countries packed into one geographical receptacle. You know, that, that is a beautiful way of you know, uh, stating the difference between India and Europe. So, India is many countries packed into one, while Europe is one country made into many. And I think it is an extremely meaningful statement because we are, of course, we are one country in a geographical and political sense, but actually within this country, we have many countries, many regions, many civilizations, many languages and cultures and the, so it, it um, india has found its own way of coping with the difference and diversity a problem encountered by the world today the inclusive worldview of india has assimilated and not othered uh, the migrants who have settled here and become part of her people so the people who came from outside became part of india that is the speciality of indian civilization and that is something that we need to keep in mind when we ask some people or people who belong to certain religion of India. No, that is not Indian at all. It is a completely European idea. The India, because India has, has not only tolerated people from outside, but welcomed them, asked them to be part of our people, and they are part of our people. We have generations of Muslims, generations of Christians, Parsis, Buddhists, Jains. Our people belong to various tribes uh, living in the Northeast and other parts of India who have been living in India for several generations together in like brothers and sisters without any kind of uh, you know contradiction or quarrel. And that is the real idea of India and not the idea of a monolithic India. India with, with a single color, a single religion a single language, a single race, etc., which is against the idea of India and so which is extremely unpatriotic. If there is something, if there is a seditious idea, this is a seditious idea to say that India belongs to a particular religion or a particular culture or a particular language. That is sedition and not saying that India has many religions and many cultures and many languages. That is, the, that is patriotism. So, so we are living at a time when patriotism is mistaken as sedition and sedition is often called patriotism and that is when we need to remember Tagore and his idea of the nation. And thirdly, civilizations do not follow a historicist hierarchization. There is no hierarchy in civilization. So you cannot say European civilization is higher than Indian civilization. Indian civilization is higher than African civilization. No, there is no hierarchy. There is only difference. There is no uh, first and second and third. There is only difference. 
African civilization is different from Indian civilization. European civilization is different from Af uh, 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 African and Euro Indian civilizations. That we can say, but we, we cannot say one is superior to the other. There is superiority or inferiority. There is, uh, there, there is only difference among different kinds of civilizations. That is the third foundation of uh, Tangor's idea of uh, uh, counter globality or an alternative idea of the nation and the world. And fourthly, history proceeds through civilizational exchanges and their effects and not through competitions. So progress in history has been made not through competition and war, but through exchanges, exchanges of religion, exchanges of culture, exchanges of language. So we should promote dialogue and exchange and not competition and war. So even, even, even invasions sometimes produce, bring new elements into culture. Uh, uh, Tagore himself gives the example of Islam. Islam introduced religious democracy and made great contributions to literature, art, philosophy, music, and art architecture. Uh, Tagore says that in an essay called An Eastern University. Uh, India is called an Eastern University. And there he says uh, Islam, for example, brought uh, new, uh, new kinds of literature, new forms of art, new forms of music. Well, look at the Hindustani music, the contribution of uh, uh, Islam to Hindustani music, or look at Mughal architecture, uh, look at um, uh, Sufi philosophy. So, uh, so the, the same thing you can say about Christianity, which gave us uh, even even our own language. You know, uh, it was the missionaries who gave us a, our first dictionary, uh, who gave us our first grammar, our first travelogue. So, all religions have contributed to the making of modern India. So, Islam's encounter with Hinduism produced Indian Sufism. And also, integrationist figures like Akbar, you know, Bin uh, uh, Tagore was full of praise for Akbar and his way of integrating Islam and Hinduism. And you, you remember, his court was famous for the continuous dialogues and the exchanges between people belonging to different religions and cultures. So for Tagore, the problem with the British is that they refuse to be part of India. You see, all other people who came to India became part of India. But the British came as traders and remained as traders and avoid India, carry everything from India, but they did not want to become Indians. While all others who came before wanted to become Indians, they were absorbed into the Indian, Indian people and into Indian culture, but the British wanted to be separate. I mean, they, when colonialism ended, they just went back. Or some, some, a few people might have stayed back, but as you very well know, almost the whole of the British went back when colonialism ended. But this did not happen to the Mughals or the, the various earlier people who came to India. That was the difference Tagore found between the British and the other people who came to India, either as invaders, or as friends, or as merchants, or in whatever way. So the, so the British refused to share their deeper values with India. India's responses were either mindless imitation of the colonizer or an assertion of national pride. So that was, you know, Tagore wanted to find a balance. So India, Indians were either asserting national pride and saying, we are Hindus, we are Indians, we are different, or some other Indians were saying, no, uh, India has nothing to give us. Uh, we should all uh, become like the British or like the French or the Americans or Germans or whoever. So, uh, but uh, Tagore wanted a kind of conversation to happen between in Indians, India, Indian civilization and other civilizations. Uh, so, our saying that we are the greatest civilization is a wrong attitude. Our saying that they are the, a greater civilization is also a wrong attitude. So there is no hierarchy among civilizations. And that is why Tagore saw literature as a major vehicle that introduces new ideas and dispositions into another culture and believed in the creativity of bicultural minds. Tagore himself was, as you very well know, 
bicultural and bilingual. He, he himself translated his poetry into English, as you know, and he wrote a lot of essays directly in English. So he appreciated bilinguality and also bicultural minds and, and believed that, that a bicultural and bilingual mind would be more creative than a monocultural or a monolingual mind. And for him, literature was a great vehicle of civilization and something to carry uh, the ideas and the values of one civilization into another civilization. That's why he believed also in the value of translation, because uh, it is through translation that we have learned um, a lot about uh, uh, world world literature. So uh, we learned about uh, you know Dostoevsky or, or uh, Tolstoy or Emil Zola or uh, Thomas Mann uh, or or Marquez, if you want. We learned about all of them through translations. And they and all of them brought to us a lot of aesthetic values, ethical principles, and a great and they gave us a greater understanding of the diversity of the world where we live in. And that was important. Commitment to change is the testament of life. Changelessness is death. That was Tagore's statement, but it has been made by many people before also. Uh, Marx also made a very similar statement. Change is the only thing that does not change. And Tagore says, commitment to change is the testament of life, the proof of life. Changelessness is death. If you stop changing as an individual, and if you stop changing as a country, you are dead. So you, you need to go on changing. And that is where life remains. Uh, you know, he has a famous essay called The Problem of the Self. That is where he speaks about this continuous self-transformation, continuous uh, change in the meaning of the self. But Tagore's, uh, I, I, I conclude, Tagore's counter-globality is not just the resistance of the local to the global, which, as we see today, seems a failed project, as the local is easily assimilated into the instrumental commercial logic of the global, but a unique mode of inhabiting the global. So Tagore's idea of the counter global was a unique way of inhabiting the global. So being in the world in a different way to make it simple. You, uh, you, you are a part of the world, you are a part of the global, but you are a part of the global on your own terms. Uh, uh, that is what he meant by uh, the counter global. It is not a denial of globality or internationalism, but it is a new kind of relationship with the global. In a way, it is also a way of reimagining the imagined community where identity is in a constant state of flux with a will to transform itself. And identity and by but are in constant dialogue, ever on the move towards a remote horizon of human unity. So human unity may not be achieved in a day, but we need to move towards an international community. We need to move towards human unity and not human division. And we can do that only through peace and dialogue and not through competition and war. That was the essence of Tagore's critique of nationalism. It was not a denial of nationalism. It was a new way of understanding nationalism as a part of internationalism. It was the way. It was a way of creating a, a new relationship between the national and the international, the local and the global. Thank you very much.